All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming to our monthly uh, meeting and to learn something more about Sichuan religions. Today is my great pleasure uh, and great honor to introduce the co-director of the project, the two Italian sisters. Actually, we also come from Veneto, from the same region. Uh, we went from this, to the same schools um, that we have been working on different traditions. So it's really great that today, Elena, uh, is going to present her research on uh, Taoist communities, lay Taoist community um, in Le Shan. Um, so, Chuan, but before the talk, I want to say a few words about Elena. Uh, she completed her BA and MA in Chinese studies from the University of Venice, and then a PhD, an MA and PhD in Chinese history and religious studies from SOAS. And she is now senior lecturer in his of history at the uh, Loyola um, University Chicago. She has been a visiting scholar on a number of institutions, including Venice, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and more recently, the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, when she went with a very prestigious fellowship. Her research interest and publication revolve around the intersection of gender, religion, and body practices in late imperial Taoism and Republican period discourses on gender and religion. And she has been publishing in 2018 two different articles, conceptual articles, really analyzing the concept of gender in the Republican period, but also another article about uh, religious and superstition and men and women and how women were making religion superstition. So she has been very much concerned about this topic. She has been published on uh, female alchemy and so the intersection also of women and alchemy. Um, she has a number of institutional roles and also uh, she's, producing uh, a number of publications. We just mentioned about her roles. She's indeed co-director of the project on uh, um, religious diversity in modern Sichuan, uh, which the Zhang Jingguo Foundation is founded. Uh, she's also co she was co-chair of a Taoist studies group at the American Academy of Religion and a member of editorial group for the international Tao Zhang Ji Yao project. And I think it was in 2018 uh, that we had the uh, uh, there was a very uh, uh, huge uh, conferences to present the results of these international um, um, projects on this very important publication. With Professor Natasha Heller, she's also co-founder of Wizard, a website, um, I think is Women Scholars in Asian Religions. And, and she's currently vice president of a society for the study of Chinese religions. Among her publication, I know this uh, paper is going to be published soon, uh, so we are going to have a kind of preview of her publication, uh, which is great. But she's also co-editing a book on the history and practice of spirit writing in Taiwan, in China, sorry, um, with also a number of scholars coming from uh, different um, academic background. Um, she is again, writing on printing, women printing uh, in the late uh, rep uh, late imperial time and Republican period. And as I said, she, you, you have been presenting and writing also a lot on the um, on female alchemy. Without any further ado, I'm gonna leave um, the screen to Elena um, for her presentation on Li Xiyue and Lei Taoist communities in Le Shan and Sichuan in general. Thank you so much, Stefania. It's, uh, uh, it's great to be here in this virtual space uh, and to see so many friends here um, and to spend some time talking about the things that we love to talk about without thinking too much about what's, what else is going on in the world. Uh, so um, I will now share my screen and it will be, and then presenter here, here we go. Um, can anybody, can, can, is it clear that anybody, can everybody yeah. see? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, today, so this is, uh, I will talk about this image later. It is a uh, Buddhist temple, which was once upon a time, a Taoist temple uh, on Ume Shan um, that I visited a few years ago. And <clears throat> I will talk about it, but mostly it's beautiful. So I wanted to uh, put it as the first slide today. Um, so today, let me just see slides. Here we go. 
So this is the uh, the title of my talk this year in the Leidas community in Sichuan. Um, and uh, what I want to talk, so this is, uh, as uh, Stefania says, uh, we, uh, Stefania and I are co-directors with the, and have a number of uh, people working on uh, uh, religions in Sichuan. And this particular talk is part of that larger project of investigation of Chinese religions in Sichuan. <clears throat> because when we started this project, we thought that not enough attention was given to the specificity of Sichuan religions and the communities that, uh, that practiced uh, religion uh, in the late imperial and, and Republican period. So um, for me, this is also an ongoing investigation of Lei Taoism in, in Lei Qing Sichuan. I've uh, been working on this uh, even before we started this uh, uh, project together. Um, and also I want to investigate Li Xiyue's connection to spirit writing, since spirit writing has been one of uh, the things I've been interested in lately. Um, also, um, I want to focus uh, more specifically on the text of production and religious publishing of this community surrounding Li Xiyue. And finally, uh, hopefully shed a little bit more light on the Taoist character and history of what we generally accept as Buddhist mountains, the Shan and Ermei Shan, and how Taoist communities inhabited and were inspired by these spaces, uh, as well as the Buddhist uh, uh, communities. So sharing the space with uh, different communities. So the sources I've been working on are generally uh, gazetteers and local geographies, uh, more specifically the Le Shan Xianzhi, uh, but others as well, the Emesha, the Emesha, uh, as well. And then a couple of biographies that, uh, that are uh, included in the Le Shan Xianzhi and then in other writings, uh, another biography that's included in the Sanxia Biju. Um, and then I also have biographies of Li Xiyue. I also have uh, done extensive uh, research or extensive searches for the first edition woodblock prints of the texts that I will be discussing here. And I found them in uh, mostly in Sichuan at the Sichuan Provincial Library, at the Chuanta Library actually, uh, in Beijing um, and in Hong Kong. And I will show you some of those woodblock prints uh, later. Um, really briefly to introduce this year, many of you probably know this year. <clears throat> But uh, he uh, was an influential teacher, scholar, and practitioner of Taoism in late imperial Sichuan. He was himself from Le Shan. Um, and, you know, as part of the hagiography, he, when he was born, his mother had a dream about him meeting a Taoist man who handed, handed him scriptures. And so we have this lore about him. Um, he um, was devoted to both Zhang Sanfeng and Lu Dongbing, uh, two very popular gods that he claims to have encountered on Ermei Shan. Um, and uh, he's often designated as the leader of the Western school Xipai of Taoism. Uh, but as we will see, it, this is an appellation that he himself helped to create and spread. Um, in his lifetime, he received and collect, received through spirit writing uh, and, and or collected and printed several scriptures attributed to Zhang Sanfeng and Du Dongbing on a variety of different topics like inner alchemy, healing, and we will see there are also some Buddhist scriptures in his uh, 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 corpus. Um, he is mostly well known for the Zhang Sanfeng Tranji, and I will um, talk about that a little bit more later. But here, let me just move on. Um, he um, was tutored on Le Shan by Li Jiaxiu, who was a well-known Confucian scholar who had successfully entered the Hanlin Academy in Beijing and had become an imperial tutor there. But then he decided that um, to retreat back to Le Shan and to create this uh, Jiu Feng Shu Yuan. Uh, a local academy on Ling Yun Mountain near Le Shan, right, uh, right on top of, uh, right beside Le Shan. Um, so he has strong connections to Le Shan. Um, Li Xue does. He also has family in and around Le Shan. He was tutored by Li Jiaxiu, who, Li Jiaxiu, who was from Le Shan and, and, and taught on Le Shan. Um, at the same time, he was also um, uh, a frequent uh, 
a visitor to Omeishan, which is not very far, as I will show you on a map. Um, and um, so, uh, again, Lore says that uh, he went to Omeishan not only to encounter Lu Dongbing and Zhang Zhangfeng, but also looking for healing after a difficult illness, another typical um, trope that we find in many uh, the lives of many Taoist uh, uh, practitioners. And there he encountered Zheng Pushan, who was a dis disciple of Sun Jiao Luan, who was a famous advocate of uh, dual sexual alchemical techniques. Um, and Zheng Pushan initiated him to the arts of Neidan. So, um, so that's more or less his connections to, Le, to Le Shan and to Omei Shan. Uh, as I said before, um, he is designated as the leader of the Western School, Shibai of, da of Taoism. Um, and, but in his lifetime, the community uh, that he created around himself was called the Inxian Pai, the School of Hidden Immortals, or Yolong Pai. Um, and fathomable, unfathomable like a dragon school and was not affiliated with an official Chuanzhen or Zheng Yi Taoist lineage as far as we know. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they believe that he um, was in a line of transmission all the way from Laozi through Zhang Feng. Uh, and Yolong refers to one of the many appellations of Laozi uh, this one relating to the mythical meeting of Confucius and, and Laozi described in the Shiji, where Confucius called Laozi Yolong. Um, so, as I said before, Zhang Zhongfeng uh, was is mostly known for the Zhang Zhongfeng Trenji. I mean, uh, Li Xiyue is mostly known for the Zhang Zhongfeng Trenji, and uh, the reason for that is probably that the Zhang Zhongfeng Trenji was reprinted in the Chongkang Ta Zhangjiao, which was a um, a, a large a uh, uh, group of texts printed in 1906 at the Taoist temple Arshianan in Chengdu. We heard about the Arshianan uh, a few weeks uh, back from uh, Volker, uh, who is here today. <clears throat> um, the uh, the Jansaf and Chengdu, uh, so the Chukang Ta Zhangjiao is itself a reprint of a previous uh, group of books called Ta Zhangjiao, but the Jansaf and Chengdu only appears um, in the printing that uh, is uh, uh, that happens in Chengdu in 1906, and this is because the um, uh, this is because the um, the editors of the Chongkang Tao Zhangjia wanted to add a local flair to their uh, uh, to to their scriptures, and so they added several texts to uh, local Sichuanese texts to the Tao Zhangjiao. And so one of these uh, com compilations was the Zhang Zhangfeng Chuanji, uh, which was, of course, had been previously printed in, in 1844 um, in uh, Sichuan by Li Xiyue. So that is why, um, that is why the Zhang Zhangfeng Chuanji is in the Chongkang Tao Zhangjiao. And that is why we uh, know more about it, because the, Zhang, because the Chongkang Tao Zhangjiao has been uh, then used uh, and and disseminated much more than all of the other uh, Li Xiyue printed works. And these are the printed works that we have from Li Xiyue as as far as I um, as far as, as as far as I could find all of these I have found in uh, first editions in woodblock prints uh, in China or Hong Kong. So some of them are related to Zhang Zhangfeng, some, are some of them are related to Lu Dongbing, and some of them are not specifically related to either one of uh, these two divinities. <clears throat> and so you can just see there, there are um, mostly, mostly are uh, uh, attributed to either Zhang Zhangfeng or Lu Dongbing. Uh, or our stories about Zhang Zhangfeng or Lu Dongbing. The second one I'll talk about a little bit later, the Rui Baoju Arjuan, is actually an esoteric Buddhist scriptures, uh, but it's always found together with the Zhang Zhangfeng Chuanji, and it was reprinted in the Chongkang Tao Zhangjiao, so that's interesting. Uh, before discussing this U.S. specifically, I just want to uh, contextualize him a little bit. Uh, but many of the people who are here today know very well this story, so I don't really need to speak too much about it. But 
Um, scholars have discussed the rise of savior gods and specifically Van San, who is here today, has discussed the, the rise of savior gods in late imperial China, namely Wen Chang, Wan Di, Li Dongbing, Zhang Sanfeng, as well as goddesses like Wu Xin Lang Wu and Guan Yin, connecting their rise to, uh, in, in part, connecting their rise to the edicts of the judging emperor canonizing them, uh, therefore acknowledging their importance in the religious life of the Qing dynasty. Uh, specifically, Monica Esposito and Lai Jitin have re reconstructed the complex history of and transmission of scriptures related to Lu Dongbing, uh, discussing in detail the process of revelation that resulted in the creation of the Lu Zetuan Shu. Uh, and so, so the, the, the rise of the savior gods leads to also the publication or the, uh, the, the uh, appearance of scriptures related to these gods transmitted through spirit writing. So, um, here are some of these uh, collections. Uh, the Luzu Chan Shu, of, for example, combines several different scriptures received at different spirit writing altars um, between the late Ming and the early Qing, and uh, published in its initial form in 1744. <clears throat> and the Luzu Chan Shu was eventually integrated into the Daozan Jiao. Uh, other groups of uh, uh, scriptures are, for example, the Wendi Chan Shu. Uh, the Jansan Feng Chuan Ji. Um, and so we have, sorry, let's go back for a second. And so we have a variety of scriptures collected into, um, uh, uh, into larger collections related to one or another of these gods. Uh, the Jansan Feng Chuan Ji specifically uh, was uh, published for the first time by this year in 1844. Um, <clears throat> And uh, actually, come uh, most some of its content comes from the Sanfen Zhu Quanji, uh, received and collected uh, by Wang Xiying, also in Sichuan. So the Li Xiyue gathered text about Zhang Sanfeng uh, from uh, the Sanfen Zhu Quanji, but also from a variety of other sources like local history, local lore, um, etc. Um, in terms of um, <clears throat> In terms of Lu Dongbing, the Haishan Qi Yu and the Chuyan Xianshan Shiji are uh, two of the most important uh, collections that we have about Lu Dongbing in, uh, uh, in the collection, uh, in the texts that uh, Li Xiyue uh, printed and published. And um, to, even though they are connected to uh, uh, Lu Dongbing, they actually don't share very much with the Lu Zutran Shu which I just mentioned. Uh, and it's more indebted, the, the, the Haishan Chi Yu and the Trian Sanshan Shi are more indebted to the connection between Li Xiyue and Lu Xixing. And therefore it is mostly based on material allegedly received by Lu Xixing from Du Dongbing. Uh, and I'll talk about Lu, uh, Lu Xixing uh, in a minute. There are some connections though. Li Xiyue was aware of the Lu Zutran Shu. He mentions several, uh, of the texts that are in the Lizu Chan Shu, like the Babin Jing, the Sampin Jing, the Chang Chung Chang Zhe, um, and uh, the Tsang Dong Jing. And he even mentions Yu Ti Shu, who was a compiler of the Lizu Chan Shu. So he was aware of the Lizu Chan Shu, but uh, uh, didn't include uh, a lot of those texts in his uh, uh, collection. Um, so I want to, uh, I want to, uh, then specifically talk a little bit about Sichuan and spirit writing. There's been a, a, an amount of work uh, done about uh, spirit writing communities in Sichuan. So I won't, uh, I won't necessarily uh, list them all here, but there are uh, people <laughs> in this room again, like Hu Jiechen, uh, Zhu Mingchuan, and Yan Yichao, who most recently uh, talked a little bit about spirit writing in Sichuan. Um, and so, and, and another, another very important scholar in, in the field is Wan Jian Chuan. So uh, there has been quite a lot of work done on communities uh, of spirit writing in Sichuan specifically. Um, myself, I myself uh, worked on the, trans, the local transmission of the Lu Zhu Hui Ji, which was also revealed by Lu Dongbing uh, in Chongzhou in 1849. Um, and so there definitely, Sichuan was a real hotbed for, <clears throat> in, the, in the late imperial period for, uh, for spirit writing. Um, and we are learning more and more and more about it. I'm very happy to say that uh, uh, many of uh, 
the scholars that are working on this are also working uh, 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 in our the project, the Sichuan uh, Religions Project that uh, Stefania and I are leading. Um, and so, apart, so with that context in mind, I want to move to um, discussing uh, discussing this year in relation to uh, Lu Dongbing, from whom he received some uh, scriptures, and uh, also his relation to Lu Xixing. Uh, so, um, according to Li Xiyue, it was Lu Dongbing that chose. Uh, his Taoist Ming and Zi, Xi Yue and Han Xu. Um, at the same time, Li Xiyue was also inspired, as I said, by Lu Xixing, uh, who, uh, whom he mentioned uh, being the leader of the Dongbai, so the, uh, the Eastern school of Taoism. So here I wanted to, met, to show you how Li Xiyue, uh, through the authority of Lu Dongbing, creates not only uh, his own uh, uh, names, or, or of course, uh, uh, you know, in his in his telling, it is uh, Lu Dongbing that uh, uh, provides him with these Taoist names. But it is interesting that his Taoist name, Xi Xing Western Star, is the mirror of. Uh, uh, I mean, Li Xi Yue Western Moon is the mirror of uh, uh, Lu Xi Xing's uh, Taoist name, Western Star. Also. Uh, the, uh, the, the Ming, uh, Han Xu encompassing emptiness is the mirror of Qian Xu secluding in emptiness. Uh, as well as we can see a couple of their writings, the uh, 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 Lu Xixing uh, wrote the Fanghu Wai Shi, whereas Li Xiyue wrote the Yuan Xiao Wai Shi. Um, and uh, Lu Xixing is um, mentioned as the leader of the Dongbai and Li Xiyue, the leader of the Xibai. So uh, Li Xiyue used Lu Dongbing's authority to align his own names and text to those of Lu Xixing because this process was all developed in uh, Li Xiyue's own writing. So I don't, if this is not clear, I'm going to try and make it clearer here. So uh, basically, uh, Li Xiyue created the Western school uh, by uh, again using the authority of uh, uh, of Lu Dongbing, uh, uh, giving him uh, these names that mirror uh, Lu Xixing's names. So, for example, this is uh, in the Hai Shan Qi Yu, which is a collection of stories about Lu Dongbing published by Li Xiyue. Um, and I didn't provide you with the Chinese here because it was too long of a quote, but. Um, uh, during the Wanli years, there was a Langshan. I do not know his name or his place of living. By profession, he was a healer. He enjoyed roaming through the clouds and water. Every time he came to Hunan and Hubei, he enjoyed the beautiful scenery on a small boat, and he played a metal flute to amuse himself. He said, Chun Yang, which is Lu Dongbing, has three great disciples that are leaders of the people. Liu Haichan opened the Southern School. Wang Chun Yang opened the Northern School. Liu Qianshu gathered together the Eastern School. Um, I, uh, Langshan, uh, want to travel west and become a recluse, personally worship at Old Lu's Gate and become the ancestors of the Western School. One day I went to the Huanghe Tower and encountered Lu descending from the sky. And he said to me, this year is Wangdi, 1606. Uh, uh, in, in 200 years, it's going to be the year 1806. Uh, holding the golden book in his hand, Lu Dongbing will descend on the banks of the Jin River in Sichuan, and he will instruct me about the Western School. So uh, Li Xiyue created the really the narrative of the Dongbai uh, and this appellation for Lu Xixing School because there's no real uh, there's no real mention of Dongbai in relation to Lu Xixing prior to uh, Li Xiyue talking about it, and so. Uh, really, uh, he creates both the Dongbai and the Xipai for himself and, and connects uh, this to uh, Lu Dongbing's descent in Sichuan. So he kind of uh, calls Li Xiu, uh, uh, Lu Dongbing to descend in Sichuan and uh, anoint him to be the creator of the Western school. Uh, this is further corroborated by a, a poem found in the Sancha Mijia, written and compiled by Li Xiyue. Uh, where he says, in my previous life, I was Langshan, roamed in a boat in Hunan and Hubei, 
Why was I drawn to go to go west? I travel aimlessly through clouds and water and misty mountains. So he basically acknowledged that he was uh, Lengsheng and he uh, and he talked about uh, meeting Lu Dongbing and Lu Dongbing coming down uh, to visit him in Sichuan. So as I say here, Li Xiyue created the narrative of the Eastern school around Lu Xixing in order to create his own identity as the leader of the Western school. He also self-anointed in the passage above as the rightful heir, heir to Lu Xixing in the person chosen by Lu Dongbing to descend onto in Sichuan and become the rightful founder of the Western school there. So um, hopefully this was clear, but if it's not, we can talk about it in the question and answer. Uh, Lee also brings, so, uh, so in terms of rooting the practice and the divinities to Sichuan, this is what uh, Li Xiyue does. He invites uh, Lu Dongbing to come to Sichuan and to give him the authority of creating the, the Western school. Um, he features them, both Dongbing and Zhang Feng, in poems describing them roaming through the mountains of Sichuan. He repeatedly mentions uh, the beauty of the mountains surrounding the community, the specific uh, uh, mountains of Lushan and Meishan, um, creates the narrative of the Western school, as I just said, um, and ties the immortals and their textual production to locally significant places. And in, in the area, he also has a supportive local community of family and friends. So in order to um, Talk, I want to talk a little bit more about the places that, uh, that appear in his uh, uh, textual sources. So the places are Erme Shan, Sui Shan, which is called, also called Er Er Shan, which is a Eastern peak of Erme Shan, closer to Le Shan, and then Le Shan itself. So here you can see, this is just a general map. You can see Chengdu right up here. And then if you go down, you see Le Shan is here and Ome Shan is here. So they're quite close to each other. And then here you can see Le Shan here and Ome Shan here, and this is Sui Shan. So they are quite close. So in terms of Ome Shan, um, uh, that Li Xiyue went to Ome Shan looking for healing after a difficult illness. He encountered the Dongbing and Zhang Zhangfang there. And he also, in his biography, explains this decision to go to Ome Shan, not only in personal terms, in terms of healing after illness, but also uh, in terms of uh, saving, uh, not only himself, but saving the world. So in more eschatological terms. Um, and that's the reason why he wanted to go to Ome Shan and wanted to meet with uh, Lu Dongbing and Zhang Saofang. Um, Ome uh, in itself, uh, as we know it more probably as a Buddhist mountain, but uh, there's a long history of immortals, of Taoist immortals finding refuge in um, 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 Shan, practitioners residing there in one of the many grottos. Uh, and mountains, as we all know, mountains with grottos were particularly efficacious for practicing immortality techniques. So um, Shan was definitely one of those Numinous mountains, uh, sources of plants and minerals, places to, for encountering mortals. Um, and so it, it makes sense that uh, Erme was also a place where Taoist immortals would gather and Taoist practitioners would, uh, would go to, to practice. Um, there's, uh, uh, again, a lot of stories, uh, hagiographical hi stories about um, the Taoists who possibly resided or went to Erme Shan. Uh, Ge Hong talks about them in the Baobutsun again. Um, Lu Dongbing is probably uh, is said to have resided on Sui Shan for a time in the Tang Dynasty. Chen Tuan and Bai Chan possibly resided there. Sun Sun Yao um, is often linked to Omei. And um, there are many prom still prominent Taoist temples from the Tang to the Ming uh, uh, that uh, were found there. Uh, and this is a list of their names. Uh, there's also a Jolial Dong, uh, a cave complex that still today serves as a site to worship Lu Dongbing. More specifically, uh, uh, there, there is definitely, there was a definitely worship of Lu Dongbing on Ome Shan prior to the Xiyue. Um, we know from two steles that are found, that were found there and now in the museum, that um, 
one dated 1585 and one dated 1633, that um, there was a Luzutsu um, built uh, on, on Omeishan uh, on the order of provincial governor He Wei Ying. And um, in order to, uh, to bring Lu Dongbing's worship to Sichuan and rescue Taoism from complete disappearance there. And in 1633, this uh, temple was uh, reconstructed and another stele was built and, uh, um, uh, in, 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 in that occasion. Uh, and the temple was then renamed Chunyan Dian. Uh, between the Qianlong and Jiaqing periods, the whole area was turned over to Buddhism and a uh, Buddhist temple was built not far from the Chunyan Dian. Uh, however, the Chunyan Dian is still there today. It is a working Buddhist temple, um, but there are no longer any vestiges of the old Taoist temple. And this is the temple, the image that I showed you at the beginning of the talk today. So the Chunyan Dian is there. I went to visit. It is a, a working uh, Buddhist temple without any reference to its Taoist past. Uh, but again, the two steles still exist uh, in a museum. Um, so this is more or less uh, the lore about the, about Ome Shan, and and we will see how the Shiye kind of banks on that lore when he talks extensively of immortals flying around Ome Shan and Lo Shan uh, and descending uh, uh, onto these mountains to transmit Taoist texts. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, we have many, many, uh, many, many uh, poems that relate to specific locations, poems that uh, were uh, collected by uh, Li Xue, possibly received through spirit writing. Um, the Yun Shui Sanji, for example, uh, is a collection about 130 poems uh, that mentions many locations on these two mountains. And here you can see in all of those places are in and around either uh, Lushan or Ermeishan. And other mountains in Sichuan, Taoist mountains in Sichuan are also featured in this uh, 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 collection of poems. <clears throat> so these uh, 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 immortals are roaming around specifically uh, locations on Lushan and Ermeishan. <clears throat> uh, to move on to Lushan for a moment, uh, Lushan, as I said, uh, was originally where, where Li Xue was from. He was tutored there by Li Jiaxiu he, uh, uh, at the Jiu Feng Shui Yuan, and he had a lot of family ties on Lushan, um, many family members on Lushan. And the location, the more specific locations on Lushan that are mentioned throughout uh, the, uh, the poems and the writings that, uh, that uh, are in this year's uh, uh, opera are these the Lingyu Mountain, uh, the Dongbo Lo, the Qingyi Bie Dao, the Uyo Si, who is a Buddhist temple, the Qingyi River, the Qingyi Yuan, the Shixian Yuan, the Dongyu Miao. All of these are on in and around Lushan. And here is a little map of the areas that we're talking about. This is the Lushan Buddha, this is the Lingyu Temple, the Dongbo Lo, the Lingyu Mountain, the Dongyu Miao. So they're all very close and, and Omeishan is on this side. Still there uh, is the Dongbo Lo, uh, which is uh, dedicated to Sudungbo. And um, Sudungbo was from Meishan, so also near Omeishan. He was interested in Taoism, self-cultivation, the predictive Atlantic arts, including spirit writing, apparently. And he talks, and Alicia talks a lot about in country Sudumbo as a divinity of Ome Shan and Le Shan in his poems. Um, and he appears in, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna necessarily go through all of the records, but he does appear as descending at the Dombolo and Jansen Feng also appears at the Dombolo. So uh, that uh, Sudumbo has now become a divinity that descends uh, and uh, and exchanges poems, for example, with the practitioners. Um, so here are two images of the areas that we're talking about. Lin Yun Shan, Lin Yun Shan is right there and right above the uh, uh, the water, and uh, and the 
the Lushan Buddha is right there somewhere around here. So, so we can see more or less where these places, where were the mortals roamed and where Li Xiyue was uh, <clears throat> active with his community. Um, so something else I want to uh, get into is the name of the place that uh, Li Xiyue, um, where Li Xiyue uh, apparently uh, uh, had all the woodblock prints that he, um, where he stored the woodblock prints that he printed um, in, uh, on, we don't know if it's on Lushan or Ermeishan, but it is the name of this place is a grotto heaven. It's, it's called Kongqing Dongdian. And Kongqing is a malachite. It's a very, very bright green um, mineral. Um, and here I have from the Ermei uh, Xianzhi um, a description of uh, Kongqing when the river floods uh, in relation to Ermei, when the river floods upon the sides of the rock is like a painting. Uh, so this is a poem. And then the commentary to the poem uh, says that Kongqing comes out from the rocky sides of Ermei mountain, but nowadays is it, it, it's not seen. So maybe it was just an amazing sight uh, when the waters that you saw uh, were receding and you could see maybe veins of this green rock. And this is the name of the rock of the grotto, uh, possibly a grotto that was all in uh, dark green, uh, where uh, apparently the, uh, the woodblock prints, uh, the woodblocks were stored, uh, the woodblock from the uh, printing that Mishue did were stored. Uh, malachite is a very, uh, is a, together with railgar and cinnabar is perceived as a spiritual substance and so, um, so it, it's not just a beautiful stone, but it's actually a spiritual substance that together with cinnabar, gold, and realgar is supposed to actually be used for producing uh, 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 Y-Dan, for producing, uh, for ingesting and achieving immortality. <clears throat> so, uh, so in here we see from the Jansan Fan Chuanji that actually uh, the Kongqing Dian, as you can see here, uh, was a place not only where uh, Li Xiyue stored his uh, wood blocks, but also apparently where Jansan Feng uh, lived for a while. <clears throat> uh, so the Jansan Fan Chuanji says uh, that there were many mortals and perfected who came traveling to the Kongqing Dian. They left alchemical instructions with the intent of saving people and waking up the mind of the whole world. And so, um, so we can see that uh, already Zhang Zongfeng um, has, uh, that uh, the Kongqing Dian is not just a location, but it's a numinous location, it's an immortal's location. Um, and here uh, again, we can see the Kongqing Grotto is the home of the Taoist, quiet and pure, far, far from vulgar noise. And then it goes on and on. Um, uh, talking about how beautiful the place uh, around the Kongqing Grotto is. And still, this is still the Jansan Feng Chuanji. So, uh, so again, the Kongqing Dongtian was, was definitely uh, where the text collected, the woodblock collected by Li Xue were stored and possibly printed. I actually said that, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, it was, it's mentioned in all the frontispieces of the original editions that we have. Um, again, Johnson Feng lived there for a while, um, and it's not clear if Kongqing uh, Dongtian was on Suishan or on Le Shan, um, but we know that it was an important location. And here are some of the woodblock prints. <clears throat> As you can see very clearly here, it, it says uh, stored um, at the Kongqing Dongtian. And you, I'm showing you this also to show you the variety of uh, um, different formats that uh, these uh, texts uh, had formats, small, smaller, and bigger formats, also different inks used. Um, this is again maybe clearer. Ban Zhang Kong Ching Dong Dian. And then uh, here we see the blue ink. Here we see the same title, but on a different ink and a different paper. This is a different. Uh, 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 those, the ones that you just saw were all find, found at the Sichuan Provincial Library, but actually the one that I'm showing you 
now uh, is at the uh, Chinese, Uni Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, but still the same place is named uh, as the place where the woodblocks are stored. Uh, here is another <clears throat> example still from the library, uh, the Sichuan Provincial Library uh, with a different uh, color paper. And here is one, the, the, the only one, um, the only one collection that I have not found the original late Qing printing for this printing is probably from the Republican period. Uh, you can see the, the difference between the style of this and the style of this. And here the difference is also that uh, um, uh, Qin Shan is actually mentioned there. Uh, and so we don't know why, because we do know that uh, uh, Kongqing Dongtian was very likely near Le Shan or Erme Shan, so we don't know if later on maybe uh, the production was shifted to Qingchen Shan, and that's why they added Qingchen Shan uh, on this frontispiece. So that's uh, that's uh, about what I wanted to say about the the uh, production, the the Kongqing Dongtian and the and the textual production. Uh, and just I want to finish with talking a little bit about spirit writing, which is something that uh, um, Li Xie has not really been connected to very much or very openly. Uh, but actually, so he obviously uh, met the immortals Lu and Zhang uh, and received scriptures from them, possibly uh, on Sui Shan. Uh, Wang Xiu Hong in his uh, uh, work has identified the names of 68 altars that might have been used for spirit writing activities by the community, by Li Xue's community in this area. And so I want to just read a couple of things that come from the Le, Xian, uh, Le Shan Xianzhi, uh, which mentions spirit writing. Um, so this person, Li Tui Gu, Li Tui Gu uh, from, uh, from Yi, uh, lived in the Qingyi Yuan, uh, which is one of the, the places mentioned often in the poems uh, in the Jansong Fan Chuan Ji. Uh, he studied Dao, for the Dao from Lu Chunyang, which is Lu Dongbing, and Chunyang would often arrive at the compound to instruct through spirit writing. There in red. Uh, again, in this case, Li Xue himself apparently uh, was involved in the practice. Uh, the clan relative Ping Chuan is Li Xiyue, came to inquire about the illness of uh, Li Yuanjing's mother, and then he asked for a prescription through spirit writing. Um, so Li Xiyue himself asked for a prescription through spirit writing, the prescription was given, and uh, the mother, uh, uh, not we don't know if the mother was saved, but uh, uh, the son, follow the prescription, which uh, involved uh, self-mutilation of the flesh to feed one parents. Um, so, but that in this case, Li Xiyue is involved in um, seeking a prescription through spirit writing. Um, other, uh, other mentions of spirit writing are in other poems. Uh, so for example, uh, Immortal Ran wrote many poems in the sand, which we know is used in spirit writing. And uh, also the Dao Danji, which is another text uh, in the corpus, uh, mentions uh, establishing an altar and inviting the immortals, which is another common way of referring to spirit writing. And so there are many, many references here. I don't necessarily need to go through all of them, but you can see in red, Fabi, for example, uh, there are different terms, and we could go into the details of that, but there are different terms that to, uh, to indicate spirit writing. Uh, but these are the most common terms. Uh, so John something also talks about spirit writing, saying it's a minor technique. And uh, sometimes actually, uh, John something says sometimes it can be used. Uh, it can be used by people. People might fake spirit writing to, uh, to entice people to follow their, uh, their directives. So, so spirit writing is uh, mentioned often as a practice or maybe as a fake practice. Um, and finally, and but very briefly though, I wanna mention that there are a couple, there's definitely a Buddhist esoteric scripture or so what looks like a Buddhist esoteric scripture in this corpus, which is uh, uh, often found with the Jansan Fen Chuan Ji. 
uh, the Rui Baoju, which is uh, uh, really unrelated to Zhang Sanfeng or Nadan practices, but opens with several incantations by Wen Chang and includes a, a text uh, uh, that's devoted to the esoteric Buddhist goddess uh, Sun Ti. Um, and here I have the text. And here I have some images. We, I don't think we um, have a whole lot of time to discuss this in particular, but I just wanted to show you how, um, you know, the variety of, uh, of scriptures that uh, Li Xiyue uh, uh, publishes uh, at the, uh, in, in his corpus, and this is one of them. Uh, the other one that, we, that I mentioned earlier uh, was that I mentioned earlier as being a Republican period uh, uh, printing uh, is, also, is all about healing through talismans. So we have a real variety of things. It's not all about biographies or hagiographies of Li Dunbing and Zhang Zanfeng, but we also have a variety of other scriptures included in the corpus. Um, in the Zhang Zanfeng Chenji, we also have this other scriptures, uh, Puti Yuan Miao Jing, um, which uh, was collected by a Buddhist monk uh, and is also Buddhist in nature. So um, I want to conclude here and uh, talk about uh, wh why did wh what's the purpose of this work? The purpose of this work is to highlight, uh, well, to focus on this Yue, which is a uh, um, uh, a figure that I was interested in, uh, but also to uh, really um, to focus on some areas that uh, were not so um, se seemingly in research that has been done so far were not highlighted. Number one, the fact that Li Xue is not only connected to Zhang Zanfeng through the Zhang Zanfeng Chuanji, but also published a number of uh, scriptures related to Lu Dongbing and also unrelated to either one of them. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, the invention of the Western school, really, or the invention of the Eastern and creation of the Western school by Li Xie in order to confer himself authority. This is not new, but it's something that it's not new in terms of, you know, how uh, religious uh, practitioners work, but it's uh, definitely something that uh, um, had not been highlighted enough, I think. So the fact that he really created the Western school and rooted it to Sichuan. And um, so, um, so, so I think it's really important to highlight his work on making his school um, so rooted in Sichuan and not only Sichuan, but Le Shan and Erme Shan specifically. As I said, the scriptures were printed and stored at location uh, either on Le Shan or Erme Shan. And, um, and also the, the fact that the community engaged with extensive spirit writing activities. Not all of the uh, texts that we find in these scriptures are spirit written, but there are spirit, writing, spirit written uh, texts in there. And um, this is another element that I think uh, um, can add to the variety of spirit writing activities in Sichuan that, uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, and, and finally, um, just mentioning the eclectic interest of this year and his community, um, as well as the fact that he was not connected to uh, to a specific temple or specific uh, transgen or gen lineage. Um, so that and and we are finding more and more of these practitioners like this year, like others who were not necessarily connected, who had communities around them, but were not connected to uh, institutional. Uh, or monastic, uh, monastic institutions, whether Buddhist or Taoist. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop right there and listen to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. This was uh, this too much. extremely, <laughs> no, well, we love too much. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's always good to have too much. Um, it was, I think the term eclectic that you have, that I saw on the last, um, uh, slide that actually says a lot about this figure. So it's a kind of, you, you introduce us in, in this eclectic world of Li Xi Yue and, and, and show the kind of network of, of um, elements that we find related to this, uh, to this figure. The 
identity strategies, so creating a narrative of a school just to create the identity of his own school. Uh, we talk about places, places that come up from the scriptures, but they're also looking at the map, uh, places that, you know, Lushan, Umeshan, I myself work on um, Lushan and slightly later period, I believe. Um, uh, but yeah, we need also to exchange notes on that. Um, but I work on the Buddhist communities on Huyo that meant that, um, that mm. you mentioned is one of my uh, major sites that I visited a few times. Um, so these places that we may associate to Buddhism, but actually they also have a Taoist past. So all these kind of contested labels that are used uh, and, and are contested more than uh, real and they have a kind of um, a reality. Uh, we talk about uh, scripture productions and, and ritual practices. So uh, it's a really, um, and my understanding is that Li Xiyue is one of uh, many figures that can be reconstructed and that can be deconstructed and open us such an uh, eclectic words like this. So it's very important in terms of methodology, in terms of results to keep in mind uh, what can come up to, uh, from this, um, um, this kind of research. So. Uh, I love it. Thank you very much. And I, 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 I do have questions, but I see there are already raising hands from um, Volker. So uh, Volker, please. Um, Volker first. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Elena. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, it was overdue to uh, say something about the Xi Pai, because um, this is actually a school of in, of inner alchemy, which is uh, still very much noticed uh, by people interested in Taoist self-cultivation today, especially in Sichuan. So I think that was uh, in, in due time uh, to have a talk about uh, the Xi Pai. And actually, I, I just, uh, I don't have um, real questions. It's just some, some things I, I noticed uh, during your talk or things I have seen here in Sichuan I would like to share with everybody of you now. And uh, for example, this Ur Urshan, uh, this, this eastern peak of Urmeshan, uh, I visited it once uh, several years ago, and especially this Zhugandong, the cavern of the of this of the swine liver, which is a very interesting place. You know, there is a, a rock formation which looks a little bit like a, a jugan or a, a pork liver. And um, or you could also say it, it looks like a mushroom used in alchemy. And um, this place still exists. It has a, a statue of Lu Dongbin in a in a reclining posture. Um, but I have no idea from which uh, era it, 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 it comes, when it, was, when it was constructed. And I was told there that the whole Ur uh, was a spot where many Taoist monasteries were located. And I climbed the mountain and looked for some leftovers of this monastery. But I have to say that it was very disappointing because all you found between just in between the fields and 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 the forests were some uh, some stones or some some uh, leftovers of, of of these buildings you, you could hardly imagine that these were Taoist temples so and even the Zhugandong uh, it used to have inscriptions steles but none of them is extant uh, they were all, I, I don't know where they went or if they were destroyed or something like that. And the guy looking after the Zhugandong, he was raising goats there. So it was ex it was extremely dirty, a very dirty story over there. And <laughs> so, but it, there were people who were looking after this cave, but anyway, not Taoists and um, it was it was really a harsh a disappointment uh, to see how 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 little uh, has been has has been left of Taoism on on this mountain on the Arashan. So I, I just wanted to share this with you. And uh, a second thing, uh, the Xi Pai is famous for its own discussion of what spot uh, in your own body you should concentrate on while meditating. 
So normally every alchemical meditation begins with Isho, Dantian. You should, you should be aware of your cylinder field, but where is this located? And so some people who say that there are adepts of the Xipai say it's a Shen Wai Xu Kong, an empty space outside of your, of your body, which may be located underneath your nose. So this might also be uh, the outcome of Li Xiyue's uh, interest in Buddhist practice. You know, Buddhist meditation is centering a lot on, 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 on breath, uh, which, which um, is, is quite different from the Taoist approach, normally beginning with the, the, the lower uh, cinnabar field. So, um, so the Xi Pai is definitely something to, to do more research on, especially on the writings. But it is again like many things in China. You know, this guy is from Lushan, and um, nothing is left of his real old home. And um, for example, there is this Qing Yi Bie Dao, this so called uh, uh, island. And I asked people in Lushan, so where was that? But they told me that it must have been where the Wuyo temple is, the Buddhist Wuyo Si, you know, just, yep. just near the giant Buddha. And the last thing I would like to share with you and um, the other friends and colleagues is that in Lushan, they rebuilt, no, you can't say rebuilt, they newly built a temple called Zixia Gong. And this is the so-called home of the Xi Pai or the Zhu Ting of Li Xiyue, although it is not at his birthplace or at any place which you can historically uh, relate to Li Xiyue. It is newly built, not yeah. too far away from uh, the, the giant Buddha of Lushan. It is totally yeah. new and it is managed by Zheng Yi Daoists now. I've been there once, but it is absolutely new. It, is, it, it has beautiful natural surroundings and a very good feng, feng shui, I'm quite sure, but it is a very new temple. So it's, it's again, like many things in China, you have no historical leftovers or relics, but um, they try to give this tradition a home in an in a absolute, in a, in a completely newly built thing now, in a newly built Taoist temple. And this is called Zixia Gong in Lushan. So if you have time and next time in China, you could make a visit to this place. So yeah, that's- actually, uh, th Thank you, Volker, for all of this. This is really, uh, I will have to uh, follow up on all of these. I, I actually have been to the Zixia Gong and I was uh, taken out to lunch by the, <laughs> by the, by the, I went, I, I went with our uh, friend, uh, Zhang Arge, uh, she took me there. Uh, and so, um, and so, yes, I, I, I guess I should have mentioned it in this talk, the fact that not only was there a creation of an identity back then, but it, there's now a recreation of a Taoist identity, yeah. there, the attempt to recreate a Taoist identity, uh, and of course, of building on the business of build, you know, the Taoist yeah. identity. And so uh, when I, I was there with a Taoist abbess, for those of you who don't know the Taoist abbess of, the, of Lao Jun Shan, and she was quite uh, unimpressed by, by the whole thing. She said, it's, uh, she said to me very clearly, this is a place to make money. Uh, and there was a very large section of it, which was devoted to burials. And so they were actually making money by hosting, uh, burying yeah. people there. They are facing and, serious yeah. problems now because this place to, to, put, to put these, these ashes of deceased I think they have to. They had to close it down, and so oh, they're really? facing serious problems now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. So I was there several years ago. I was there maybe four, four years ago, and so. Um, and but but yes, I, it's it's good that you remind me of this because I should also mention that maybe in the writing that I do about this that not only was you know the creation of the Taoist identity back then by Li Xue, but also this recreation, uh, contemporary recreation of building on the lore that I just tried to mention, you're building on uh, the lore of the Taoist uh, presence there. And as you say, we don't really know exactly how much presence there was, 
um, except for, you know, for example, these two stelies that we have from Emeshan, those we have, but, and, and, and everything else is in the writings of the Shia, for example, in these poems where they mm -hmm. mention specifically all these places like the Qingyi Biedao and, you know, various other places, but we don't have remains. Uh, the only other one, when I went, when I went to uh, Emeshan to look for uh, 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 remnants of uh, Lu Dongbing, and the mm. two things, the only the only one that I could find was the Chunyang Dian, which is the Buddhist temple, uh, which is now a Buddhist temple. Yes. Um, mm. And then I was taken to this Zhejiagong, but it was clear that it was just a recreation. Um, but it's it's worth yeah, mentioning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so so thank you for for bringing, and also thank you for I I did not go to the Jugandong, so I'm very glad to uh, to hear uh, about that. And I wonder if though the statue of uh, uh, Lu Dongbing is also newly built and kind of put there because Lu Dongbing, of course, is a famous uh, is a famous god, and so why not Probably. put a statue of Lu Dongbing there, right? Um, so there is definitely a problem in. Uh, collecting information, you know, uh, you know, we can collect them from uh, Tifanji, uh, and then we can collect them from poems, but we cannot really see uh, almost anything on the ground. Um, so it's it's hard to distinguish what's. Uh, um, yeah. So, but but thank you for all of this, and of course, uh, we would love. I would love part part of going back to Sichuan would be to go. Uh, to Lushan and to revisit these places, but of course we haven't yep. been able to. So thank you for being there for us. And <laughs> I will try to to go there again. And of course we keep in touch. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Volker. Well, basically we need we need to be able to go back to China. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. we are going to make Volker our slave. <laughs> I'm going to different I also have a few um, places. So a paid later. slave, that would be okay. <laughs> then yeah, we, we can pay you. And then, but we would really love to go and also to have some uh, Santa Mien or, or uh, you know, and then to actually see the place. Um, so, Van San, you have us. Yes. Yeah, my turn. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Elena. That's really. Uh, extremely important, fascinating material and very nice analysis. I was wondering about your um, use of the term lay community <laughs> around Li Xiyue, but and, uh, not, I'm not, we could discuss the lay <laughs> word, but um, my question is about the community word. Uh, do you get a sense that it was something that uh, found an institutional basis and continued beyond uh, Li Xiyue and after Li Xiyue's death, do you get a sense that it, it was something that remained stable for a certain amount of time? Or is it just by community, do you just mean the network of people who were around Li Xiyue and that did not yeah. continue beyond that? Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, Vansant and I have had the discussion about the, the question of lay uh, versus non-lay, so I thought maybe you wanted to ask that question. But um, but anyways, yes, I, I in my in my sense, and and I uh, again, there's actually not very much um, research uh, done on uh, uh, on this year and the the the, the post uh, life, you know, the life after he died. But um, my sense is that the community itself, community, it, yeah. Co by 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 community, I mean the people who gathered around him, and helped, uh, you know, who received these texts or helped with the publication, and probably gathered together for rituals and spirit spirit writing sessions. Um, my sense is that after Li Xiyue, um, the 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 afterlife of Li Xiyue uh, is, or, or the Xipai rather, is uh, um, not. Um, so there is no community that we, we that we know of. There are some people, especially in the Republican period, who kind of want to receive the uh, uh, what? How how would you how would you call that? So who want to be who want to be connected to the Xinyue and to uh, 
uh, to, to have that connection to the CPI. And so they continue to, for example, uh, transmit some or reprint transmit some of these texts. Uh, and then eventually we know that the, 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 the CPI uh, travels to Taiwan. So there are uh, people in Taiwan who still are part of uh, the CPI and, and they see themselves in a line of, uh, of transmission. Uh, with uh, with the CUN, with the CPI, but I don't see that he actually um, bestowed um, a transmission onto anyone in particular. I wonder if Tony Edwards wants to say something about that because I think you you've been working on this, right? Uh, I don't know if that's uh, if you want to be put on the spot. Uh, thanks, Elena. Um, I, I won't um, take up any, any more time from, from, from your questions, etc. But yeah, this is a work in, in progress, and maybe we can talk about it some other time. Okay. But some other time. I, 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 I would suggest it, it died out and it was a, a re recreation. Yeah. So that's that's my sense, and uh, that um, that it really died out at the time. But people try to, you know, uh, basically again re recreate the. Uh, uh, the the Western uh, the 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 CPI by appropriating some of the texts and retransmitting them in China and then of course uh, with the uh, you know with the with with everything moving to Taiwan or not everything but with people moving to Taiwan also moving this kind of tradition to Taiwan and uh, we know that Xiao Tianshi for example did publish some of Li Xue's. Uh, 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 books uh, in in his series so uh, we do know that there was interest in that period and there continues to be interest today in Taiwan I, I remember years ago I went to Taiwan and and I chatted with uh, uh, somebody who was uh, a practitioner of the CPI and he gave me several books about the the the, uh, the CPI today uh, in Taiwan and so um, I haven't done that follow-up work, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that it's a, a recreation, basically. So I hope that that answers your question, Vincent. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Uh, Lars, I see you have a question. Oh, you're muted. I have a very brief question, namely one relating to the slide where you said that uh, uh, he cautioned people to look out for fake, was it fake, false uh, spirit writing? Um, yeah. Because, um, th this is something which, by coincidence, I've been doing in the context of Christian communities uh, in the early Republican era, where you have correct um, indications such as spirit writing and false ones. I, I wonder whether he's... Uh, uh, said anything more about it more concretely or um, is that the uh, only um, instance where you found him saying this? Uh, good question. I think that I would have to go back to the whole, uh, this is a longer uh, discussion um, on spirit writing, but I think that in, when he talks, about, so he, he talks about, um, uh, let's see, the, the this section ends by him saying uh, that these fake practitioners will be found out by the gods and incur the wrath of heaven, basically. And so he's very strongly against these, you know, fakers. Um, I don't know that there's a longer discussion of it apart from this. I honestly, I don't recall that there is, but there could be, and I you know, didn't read it, uh, but uh, that was something that really caught my eye when, uh, you know, was discussing uh, this, but uh, he's very, very, you know, he uses very harsh words against the people who are fakely using spirit writing for their own gain, so they're using uh, to, uh, to provide medicine, for example, he says to provide medicinal recipes and heal illnesses. So he, he really is uh, railing against people who are harming people through spirit, through sp fake spirit writing. So I don't recall that there's a longer discussion of it, uh, but I may be wrong. I, but what your question was that, do you see this in the context of spirit writing or just in the context of, of fake spiritual leaders? Of fake spiritual 
signs, so leaders, yes, and, and spirit writing that th does come up uh, in the in the Republican text as well. So it's uh, yeah. I mean, if I find anything, then I should send it to you yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you. And I don't know if Van Sant, is Van Sant still? Uh, is it has, is an old hand? Maybe it was a new hand. Old hand. I think Van Sant is a new hand or is an old hand. No, no, sorry, that's that's the old end. <laughs> you know, old, 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 we are old China ends, right? <laughs> old China hands, yeah. Yes, okay, I, I got it down. Now. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's you know the Zoom terminology, old end and new hand. But uh, Hu Jiechen, uh, you have a question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a very quick question. Speaking of the Kongqing Dongtian, uh, maybe I missed something. Uh, you, you have mentioned a small annotation talking about that Kongqing, this kind of mineral, could be found uh, on Ermeshan, right? So, so this, this uh, is this annotation found in some Li Xiyue's book or no, somewhere no, else. it's not. No, it's mm. it's just in the Yeah, so I found it in the Ermeshanji. I didn't find an explanation of what Kongqing is in any of mm. these years writings. Uh, oh, I just okay. found it there. It's actually really difficult to find any reference to Kongqing in general uh, uh, or mm. the Kongqing Dongdian. Uh, but but so I'm assuming I this is my connection. Mm -hmm. I connect uh, you know this uh, explanation of Kongqing uh, for Ermei Shan to the possibility that he's talking about this uh, mineral when he talks about Kongqing uh, Kongqing Dongdian. I'm assuming yeah. this. Mm. I, I think it's possible uh, because I also run into some materials talking about Kong this kind of mineral, Kongqing, it was always mentioned that it could be found in somewhere in Sichuan. I think oh. it's in Mayan Guozhou or something. Yeah, yeah, I will write to you later. Thank you. Uh, talking about the, the, the details. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So it is possible that uh, Li Xiyue or his disciples, they created the, 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 this mis mysterious place or or a real publishing house naming Kongqing Dongtian, but it could be related to, to Ermei Shan. And if not, it should be also in, in Sichuan, I think, because this kind of a special mineral was related to Sichuan in, in the whole, uh, or through the Chinese history, I think. So, oh, that's, that's great to know. As, uh, as, so. as we know for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so okay. obviously, mm -hmm. uh, we don't because we there are no specific references to the place where this actually is this yeah. Kongqing Dongdian. It could be, as you say, a complete fabrication by saying, "Okay, you know, we store these uh, uh, these prints in this very luminous place." Um, uh, but uh, I have not found any corroborating evidence that this place existed. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so that's that's all I know. Uh, the, the earliest uh, material mentions uh, relates Kongqing to Ermei Shan could be found in an, in a Fu, uh, uh, sh, sh, uh, I, I forgot the name, uh, contributed by a Nan Chao literatus named Jiang Yan. So also, anyway, I will write to you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, with all the details. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much yeah. for your answer. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Any more questions, comments? Maybe you might have found those information this year. Fabrizio. Hello. Ciao. Good to see you. Ciao. <laughs> I have a, a, a small remark and maybe also a question about uh, 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 this U.S. creation of the Western and the Eastern lineages. I had read something about, you know, this, this parallelism between uh, East and West uh, and, uh, and the titles of their works and their, their how and so forth. And um, um, so, of course, one of the 
uh, points in common uh, between uh, 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 the UN and Lucy Singh is, is, is Liu Zongbing, of course. But I think there could be something um, more, more, let's say, more important. Um, so, as you know, the, the creation of the, of the Western uh, and Eastern lineages culminated in the, uh, during the Qin Dynasty in, in, the, in the theory of the five schools of yep. um, the, the, the Wuxia or, or the five Wubai. And so, um, so um, um, Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western, and Central. Central. Yeah. So, um, it seems to me that uh, uh, when uh, uh, this Yue created his own uh, Western lineage and also attributed uh, Lu Xixing with the creation of the Eastern lineage, he actually wanted, what he actually wanted to do is create a new lineage which could stand alongside the, the much better known and, and, and more prestigious Southern and Northern lineages. Yep. So, um, uh, actually, I would really like to know who, <laughs> at the end, came up with the theory of the five schools. But I think that uh, um, uh, this US point would be a, exactly this one, you know, create a school that could uh, be, let's say, at the same level of, of importance, especially not uh, with, with Lucy Singh's lineage, but with uh, uh, the northern and southern lineages. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you, and uh, I guess I didn't I didn't make that clear, but uh, but definitely because he himself mentions not only the west the, the eastern school, but also the northern and southern school in that in that passage that I read, and so obviously he wants to um, uh, to compare himself not only to Lucy Xing, but yeah. also to the northern and southern schools. So yes, yes, definitely that's that's a point that I probably should make more clearly. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the, the Wupai, uh, I don't know who came up with that, but uh, we then see it very clearly uh, in in the Republican period, we see it very clearly discussed. Um, I so. think it could be a bit earlier, it could still be the Qing Dynasty, but I really don't know who, who created this, the, the, the term and the concept of high schools, which by the way, do not exhaust at all the, the, the landscape of Maidan in the in the exactly. Of course, but anyway, you know, it's a sort of classification of uh, five schools, five, uh, five, uh, five types of Neida. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that point. Yep. Ciao. Ciao. Uh, yes. There are more people coming in. I think. Oh, okay. Yes. I the got... rumor of Li Xu Yue. <laughs> um, They're roaming in the room. Yes. Okay. Jin Hu Jie Chen. Chen. Uh, another quick question. Actually, you mentioned that Li Xiyue also talking about the, the uh, also has some eschatological dimensions. So, so is there any specific uh, historical context or what, what kind of Jie he is, he is talking about? Because I, I right. It's I don't know. Than, than 1840, right? So, 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 yeah. Uh, well, the 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 <clears throat> the, uh, the printing actually it's all around between 1844 and 1847. Mm -hmm. The printing of these, uh, uh, mm -hmm. so it is after 1840, um, and so it could be the language uh -huh. that was the, the, the language that was definitely. Uh, floating around in the area at the time um, uh, that influenced him. Uh, he doesn't <laughs> specifically mention what, you know, what kind of jie, uh, 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 he's referring mm. to, but, uh, but it seems to me, although I, you know, I haven't made a direct connection, but it seems to me that there is, that, that language is in Sichuan at the time is being used. Um, so, but because I don't have a specific, you know, textual connection. You know, there's there's not more than I can say, but but the time is right. The time is, you know, the 1840s. He he published. He prints uh, all of these print are printed between 1844 and 1847. Uh, so it it still could be the Gengzi, right? Yeah. The, the Gengzi. 
uh, it could GM. be mm, yeah could be. it could okay. be he doesn't he, he doesn't mention specifically mm. anything mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. okay, yeah thank you thank you very much yeah thanks for that question though while we are waiting for questions the non-taoist expert um one that you mentioned also uh, Uyos, uh, is one yeah. of the temples that you find mentioned in his scriptures uh, yes but it's, it's, it's just like uh, did he say anything about the temple? no uh the, you know these places are mostly uh mentioned in poems and oh. um and so there isn't really any specific description of a place or they are they are mentioned as places uh, of you know of, of spiritual importance um and so where uh, where uh, immortals descend or where uh or practitioners practice and i think i actually i have to check or i have to double check exactly how the wioso is mentioned um so i don't want to say uh, yeah i don't want to say specifically that that was used as a place for gathering uh, for them i know many others many others that i've listed are definitely places where um these people gathered uh for spirit writing sessions or for you know other kinds of possibly other kinds of rituals but the wuyo so specifically i don't want to say um that it was used in that way because i cannot i, I have to go back and check basically yeah, well, um, i will also go back to my yeah. own material because my uh, i'm looking especially on the republican period but there mm -hmm. is also an interest for the previous abbot who was leaving slightly older than Li Xuye, uh, but uh, is leaving pretty much was alive when Li Xuye uh, was, was there. Active. So it could have been when I went to Uyo Se, I was not shown anything of a Taoist name. It was, I was shown things that were not Buddhist, um, but I was not made any connection to that. But I will also go back to my notes and see if I find um, yeah, it's it's hard to find. So, for example, that Buddhist temple that is the Chunyan Dian, and now it's a Buddhist temple. Uh, it's still the, the only thing that retains that identity of a Taoist temple is the name. Uh, mm -hmm. But but there's you know I visited and took pictures, and there's really nothing. And even though, or maybe I didn't notice it, but even though the the temple itself seems uh, quite old, uh, you know I don't know exactly what the buildings themselves where when they are from but they don't seem to retain any kind of Taoist features. And, and of course, uh, uh, you know, it, it would be difficult. No, but the to... Wuyos, Wuyos, no, but uh, Chu Yantian also uh, looks very Buddhist uh, when yeah. I go there. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so again, it's hard to retrace the history of these uh, yeah, places. But it would be, except... yes, it would be interesting to see connection among communities. Uh, yeah, not to go back to the term community, but um, so that's the only that connection be. that I got that I have. Uh, you know, the last slide I had uh, on that Buddhist uh, text um, that there is a description of how that text was uh, um, put in the collection was entered the collection uh, of uh, Li Xiyue, which was through a disciple of Li Xiyue who had a friend who was a Buddhist abbot, and this friend said, you know, I have this text, it's an excellent text, uh, I want to rescue it from oblivion, can you reprint it? And so then, um, even though it was a clearly Buddhist text, it was reprinted. And so in that sense, there was obviously a communication between uh, communities and- It was a cooperation, it was yeah. it's cooperation, so. But that's, um, so that's very specific and I'm glad I found that, but uh, in terms, for example, of the other uh, more, uh, uh the other <clears throat> so there's two buddhist texts that i talked about one the other one was just in, in included without any reference to why and how you know for what reason it was included um so there's a, it's a little bit uh difficult to dis determine you know the, these connections i have a second uh yeah well, quick question Go ahead. Um, I understand we're talking about a, a male community or? Um, 
Yes, so far, uh, so far, I have only, I have not determined that there were women involved. Uh, but of course, as we know, you know, the yeah, uh, it's it's harder to find uh, women who uh, who are mentioned in. You know, there may have been women involved, but they are not mentioned, as far as I know. Uh, Junglian has a question. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Long time no see. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, if I uh, understood well, uh, the name of school Xipai is uh, invented by uh, Li Xiyue uh, uh, himself. So uh, uh, I, uh, do we know how local people call them, uh, call the school and call the, the, the followers of the community? Uh, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, as I said at the beginning, the, the more, let me just go back to my slides here. Uh, the more, um, let's see here, I don't want to say something wrong. So, so in, in his lifetime, the community was called uh, Insian Pai, School of Hidden Immortals or Yolong Pai. Um, so this is a more common way of, uh, talking about it but um, you know it's um, it's actually yours is a good question in the sense of, of where when does the the name Sipai actually become common um, and and with whether when does it uh, um, sort of uh, uh, obscure the the name Insian Pai and Yolong Pai and that specific question I don't know how to answer because uh, yeah I would have to see how often it is used when, how often it is used when, but um, in his lifetime, it was more common for this school, this group of people uh, to be called Inxian Pai and Yolong Pai. And the, the local people call them uh, Dao Shi Wu Xian Sheng or, or other, or you used other term to, to, to well, again, it's uh, you know, it's uh, hard to know uh, what local people did because um, there aren't very many. Uh, you know, most so most of the information we have about uh, about this community is either from their own texts, so you know, texts that were produced by that community, or occasionally in the Le Shan Xian Zhi as I, you know, I've uh, translated a couple of anecdotes there where they are not called Daoshi and they are not called uh, in that way. But um, it's hard to say what the local people at the time actually called them. But uh, in, in the Le Shan Xianzhi, when there are anecdotes about them, uh, they are not uh, using any kind of uh, term that would uh, indicate uh, that they are that they are priests. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No, Fabrizio wrote something on the... Uh, in fact, as far as I know, the Lishia school is still called uh, Yolong Pai. Okay, thank you. Any more okay. questions uh, about... There is so much to talk about. Um, too, yeah, too much, but uh, I wanted to put it all out there so that I could get good questions. <laughs> and actually I'll go in and definitely incorporate in the article I'm writing uh, all of the, all the comments that, uh, that you mentioned, that, that you all had. Adam is silent. Adam is silent. Well, if there are, uh, yeah, that's fine. It's nine thirty-four. More, yes. Well, we we had uh, <laughs> more than. Oh, oh Darcy, um, Darcy Litra has a question. Okay. Uh, uh, you're, you're you're muted. muted. Sorry. 
Okay. Nice to, to meet you, Eleanor, and thank you for Hi. the talk. It was really interesting. Thank I mean, you. there's a, a couple of questions, I think, leading from the, the talk just now. The first one yeah. is just how this Ting lay community of Taoist alchemists or lay alchemists, if you like, differs from uh, the Republican period. So uh, these lay communities of Chen Yingning, for example, are there some really big differences between these two kinds of um, self-cultivation communities? And the second is just in relation to, to scholarship in China at the moment around Li Xiyue, because it seems that in Western scholarship, very few people have actually touched on Li Xiyue, but in China, I mean, there's, there, there are scholars who've written and published a lot. Just what are these discussions and debates in um, Chinese scholarship about Li Xiyue, basically? Are you aware of this at all? Or mm -hmm. This is something you've, you've also looked at. Yeah. So in terms of Chen Yining and uh, <clears throat> so I think that uh, uh, it's uh, it's a <laughs> these are two big questions. Uh, so in terms of uh, comparing uh, these kinds of uh, communities, so-called communities, and uh, Chen Yining, for example, uh, uh, the first of the first obvious difference is uh, Chen Yining is uh, in Shanghai in a big uh, in a big uh, urban center and they at least the ones that i have uh, had uh, you know researched in sichuan are you know both for example uh, uh li xiuye but also fu jinquan and and others that other people have uh, worked on are not in generally in urban centers they are you know on mountains or on you know smaller um in smaller smaller centers and so that's uh, and also the, the the other big difference that I find <clears throat> is uh, the access to you know the printing practices. Um, so we do know both, for example, for for the two uh, for the for the three actually communities that I have uh, worked on in Sichuan, uh, they all had um, access to woodblock printing, uh, but but you know limited access to widespread printing because printing at the time was very expensive you know printing you know woodblock carving was expensive uh paper was expensive ink was expensive uh and so these uh, these uh, and these communities don't seem to have a whole you know they don't necessarily have uh access to a lot of money um the one um uh, the one project, for example, that we know had a lot of uh, support, financial support, was the Chungkan Dao Zanjiao in 1906 in Chengdu. And that, of course, had institutional support, institutional money to, um, you know, to, to bring it to fruition. So I would say that in terms of printing practices, they, uh, they are limited, they have limited printing. Uh, uh, and, and that's also why it's so hard to find the... Uh, the originals of these uh, of these uh, texts, uh, in terms of course of Chen Yining, he had a completely different access to printing. He was, uh, you know, he had his own um, a journal, and so he could print all the things. In fact, he reprinted a lot of the late Qing, uh, uh, late Qing texts that uh, that were, you know, that were printed in. Uh, in Sichuan, for example, or in other places. And so um, he's, uh, so that is something that, uh, that I think is really, really different. He disseminated this knowledge much more widely uh, because of the easy access to printing because printing at that time was a completely different uh, enterprise. Um, uh, so, so I think, uh, and, and I'm not sure. So this is something that uh, uh, you know uh, we could also ask Liu Xun, for example, in terms of you know the relationship between uh, master and disciple, you know, leader and disciples. I think probably that relationship was different uh, in you know in Li Xue's time or Fu Jinchuan's time to Chen Yingming, and you know what kind of who determines what what's what's the relationship between Chen Yingming and his so-called disciples? We know that. You know, he exchanged letters, uh, but it seems that there was much more of a um, of a, a, a more I don't know if equal relationship, but on equal more equal terms than 
a master disciple relationship that we might see. And this I'm generalizing here, but but I do think that uh, the social um, uh, uh, context is is also different uh, there. Um, and also training um, was not necessarily bringing forth his own uh, school, the, you know, the Chengining school. He really was interested in uh, making available uh, uh, many different kinds of uh, literature relating to Neidan. Um, and which he collected and reprinted. And then he was interested in um, uh, making it more available. So his role was more of a explainer. He was explaining very much the, uh, uh, the contents of these sometimes a little bit uh, uh, difficult to understand uh, Nadan materials. Uh, so, so I don't know that uh, it's really a school uh, around him with disciples in the same way. Um, but anyway, so that's uh, that's what I think about that. And then in terms of the uh, what has been uh, published in China about Li Xiyue, there's a couple of different kinds of, uh, uh, of studies that I've seen. Uh, some studies are extremely specific um, uh, textual studies. So, for example, uh, there are uh, textual studies of the Jiangsan Feng Chuanji and where exactly all of these texts are coming from, uh, uh, where, you know, the different editions, there's a whole different, uh, there's a whole series of articles about different editions of the Jiangsan Feng Chuanji and uh, by looking at the printings and by looking at the style and by looking at the, um, colophons and uh, the prefaces and dating. So there's a lot of that. Uh, I mean, not a lot, but you know, there definitely are studies, very specific textual studies, and but only interested in revealing important, very important details about printing and dating and who was involved with what, you know, who was involved in this printing and then the reprinting and what was included and what was excluded. Um, and so that textual study is very much uh, a, a part of the, the scholarship. And then the other part of the scholarship, I think, and, and of course, I don't know all the scholarship, but the, the, the things that I have seen uh, don't seem to uh, discuss very much the social context or basically the, the narrative, the narrative of the Sipai is not challenged. Um, so the narrative that we have for the Shipai is not challenged. If you if you read the you know uh, for example uh, the Dao Jia Shi, uh, but but uh, everything after the Dao Jia Shi and how Li Xiyue is uh, is uh, presented in 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 a lot of works after the Dao Jia Shi was published are similar. Um, so basically, you know. Narr the, the similar narrative that we all know, and, and some of some of which I have used in my presentation. But uh, for example, the discussion of the, the construction, the, the construction of the Xipai and the construction of the Dongpai are not really uh, discussed. So that's that's what I see. But maybe you know more and you can tell me. No, I don't. I don't. But I, I'm very interested just how, you, because I'm facing a similar kind of situation. It's how to get access to these sources to build this biographical data. So, I mean, there is the, the, the in the text, there's a trans, I mean, I have a couple of prefaces or something to work off, so it's very limited. But it's just uh, in terms of sourcing, the, I mean, finding archives or finding material to, to go off. How would you choose? Yeah, the sources, so I find, so the way I started is obviously going to some Chinese narratives of, of the issue and then and then trying to understand and you know try to widen uh, the perspective uh, by number one looking for the actual sort uh, the actual uh, printed you know originals in uh, archives and I was lucky to be in Sichuan to be able to to do that and so just physically seeing uh, these um, these volumes. Uh, and looking at those prefaces, for example. So looking at prefaces and then 
Uh, I find, uh, I always find uh, TIFANJ to be uh, quite interesting and important. And now that you can, ever since we've been able to search them online, it's been a amazing uh, jump, uh, you know, for scholarship because you can search for names, you can search for terms. And so uh, that is uh, really, really uh, important. But basically um, gazetteers, uh, prefaces and 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 as I said, there's a lot that's missing. Uh, so in, in some cases, you cannot retrace. Uh, you you just cannot. You don't have. So in some cases, you're lucky and there are stealings, uh, but not always. Um, in some cases, if you go to the places like Volker was able to go to these places and I was able to go to these places, you can find something on the ground. So it's a variety of different things put together, uh, and uh, but uh, there are holes. There definitely are holes, and so you know that's uh, it's just, so you do what you can. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's very useful. It's very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Some guidance. I yeah, and so sometimes is. sometimes sources are also contradicting themselves when it comes to numbers or. Yes, even people who actually wrote an autobiography, maybe they wrote it so late and then they're messing up dates. So the reconstruction is always uh, a difficult enterprise. And you also have to be careful about the agenda of each person yeah. that is that is writing, uh, because you have to know where did they get that information, uh, you know, and what's their agenda and, 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 and why are they reproducing that kind of uh, narrative. Uh, so, I have okay. A, it's kind of a, I don't know what we're, how are we for time? Do we still have a little bit more time? Uh, well, we, we're all here. Yeah. I may as well keep keep asking. I mean, my, another question I'm, I'm interested with Huang Yuanzi, I'm looking at the, the three teachings and how he brings them all together and what elements he brings together. So I'm kind of curious again with um, Lisi, who's very close. I mean, there are some overlaps. Um, for example, with the concept of Shrengguan Yitia, this is also recorded in Lisi Yue's works. But I'm, I'm just curious, um, we have touched on it a little bit here, just the Buddhist elements. I mean, I noticed perhaps Chan, which is generally a, an internal alchemy kind of thing, but is, have you been able to extract the, the Buddhist elements that are contained within his works or the Confucian elements or? Uh, I haven't tried to, uh, to distinguish. Um, so as, as I said, I've, I've noticed the uh, inclusion of Buddhist uh, uh, texts in uh, the, the, the whole corpus. Um, I don't know that I see uh, that I have seen um, necessarily Buddhist uh, um, Buddhist elements in in his, or Confu well, and then Confucian elements is even more is even more difficult because you know Confucian elements are everywhere, so it's it's kind of hard to distinguish them. Uh, and, and also, we have to be careful because there are Buddhist elements that. Uh, in fact, our common, you know, common parlance at the time. And so do we uh, distinguish them as Buddhist because there is a specific Buddhist, you know, influence or do we take them as uh, just part of uh, how people talked about, um, uh, about spiritual, uh, spiritual progress uh, maybe. So, so I don't know. Um, and. Yeah, so I, I really don't know how to answer that question. Also, because actually, um, in in the things that I have looked at by Li Xi, I don't necessarily see very uh, things that are jumping out as oh Buddhist inside the Taoist kind of uh, uh, apart from the Buddhist text that I've mentioned. But inside the the Taoist texts, uh, I don't see anything that's jumping out as oh this is definitely Buddhist. Uh, but but Volker was was talking. Uh, about that, uh, I think Volker just earlier was talking about something, right? Uh, the uh, 
the show the 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 idea of um, of a different place where you start the practice and that and he was identifying that as possibly Buddhist. So, you know, there may be and, and there are definitely elements that I haven't uh, picked out. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so nothing comes to mind uh, specifically. Yeah, just from I mean, I haven't looked at the text yet, but just um, from from secondary sources, I read about the um, Buddhist system of Tiadinghui. So the three stages of, um, I suppose, Buddhist Buddhist practice. Um, but I'm just here. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting just to see how he incorporates that into the system of internal alchemy as well. So it'd be kind of. Are you, are you saying that you see that in Huang Yuanji or? Just, just from reading secondary sources, I think it was Li Yuan Guo maybe wrote a um, piece on Li Xu, Xu Yue, if I'm not mistaken. And he was talking about um, Jie Ding Hui, so the three, three Buddhist um, stages of practice, if you like. So I think that could possibly be one area, but I'd, obviously I don't know how much, much leeway he gives to that in the, the text, of course. But. Yeah, I haven't seen that by uh, Li Yuan Guo, so I can't comment on that. Yeah, uh, um, yeah so, but, but yeah, it, it's definitely an avenue to look at and to really understand, uh, yeah, really understand how that, you know, whether it is a Buddhist influence, whether it is, basically common uh, par parlance at the time. So, but I haven't done that kind of work. Yeah. I'll give the, give the floor to somebody, <laughs> somebody else. <Yeah>. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Desi, for, for your question. And also um, talking about other uh, interesting uh, figures that need mm -hmm. investigation. So 